Hello, everybody. Uh, Professor Nagy here. We are going to talk about geographic principles today. Um, a little bit more of uh, following up on cartographic principles. A little bit different. Cartographic is about map production um, and how those elements in map design help aid the reader and explain the things that you're doing through the map product. Geographic principles are a little bit different. They're a little bit more of the foundational geographic knowledge uh, that's part of GIS. And so in order to understand how a GIS works, you must have a good grasp of a few principles, spatial reference, coordinate systems, map projections, and scale. Talk a little bit about scale and uh, cartographic uh, preparation, but again, more kind of the, the fundamentals uh, before you get to map design and map uh, production. So a spatial reference describes where features are located in the real world. Uh, everything has a location on the real world, uh, on, on the surface of the uh, planet, and a spatial reference describes that. And so a geographic coordinate system, abbreviated by, abbreviated by GCS, is defined by a datum, an angular unit of measure, usually degrees, and a prime meridian that is the starting point. A projected coordinate system, abbreviated as PCS, consists of a linear unit of measure, typically meters, feet, uh, you know, some sort of uh, unit of measure that a linear unit of measure we're familiar with, a map projection, the specific parameters used by the map projection, and a geographic coordinate system. So a projected also includes geographic coordinate system as well, whereas a geographic coordinate system isn't a projection, but a projection includes a GCS. A projected or geographic coordinate system can have a vertical coordinate system as an optional property. Um, most of the time we're talking about a horizontal uh, coordinate system. So a vertical coordinate system abbreviated as VCS references Z values. Uh, Z uh, indicates the third dimension um, and it's used to denote elevation. Um, a vertical coordinate system includes a geodetic or vertical datum as well, um, a linear unit of measure, an axis direction, and a vertical shift. I know this is a lot of information to start off, but it's related to spatial reference and kind of the big, the big picture behind all of this stuff. And we'll get into more specifics as we go through. Coordinate system. So kind of thinking back to uh, when you're in geometry, maybe you did this in geography class um, at some point, but a lot of students tell me that they didn't do a whole lot with uh, coordinate system geographic principles in a geography class. So we're gonna go over these things. So coordinate systems enable geographic data sets to use common locations for integration. Again, how do we put all these maps together? If there are different areas across the planet, how do we put them back together? Um, a coordinate system is a reference system used to represent the locations of geographic features, imagery, and observations, such as GPS locations, uh, within a common geographic framework. And so again, the coordinate system as a common geographic framework. Each coordinate system is defined by the following. Its measurement framework, uh, which is either geographic, in which spherical coordinates are measured from the Earth's center, or planimetric, in which the Earth's coordinates are projected onto a two-dimensional planar surface. So again, we're talking about the globe as a uh, sphere, and then we're talking about uh, taking that sphere and flattening it out into a two-dimensional surface, a flat surface. Um, coordinate system is also defined by units of measurement, Again, typically feet or meters for projected coordinate systems or decimal degrees for latitude longitude. The definition of the map projection for a projected coordinate system and other measurement system properties such as sphere of reference, a datum, one or more standard parallels, a central meridian and possible shifts in the X, y, X and Y directions. What's important to know here is that uh, you don't necessarily need to know the specifics of all of these things because there are several uh, uh, several hundred geographic coordinate systems and a few thousand projected coordinate systems. Um, you can also define your own custom coordinate system, uh, but as we talk, I'll, I'll provide more uh, context for uh, the geographic coordinate system and projections that are um, most commonly used. Um, and that you will encounter in a GIS or even internet mapping technology for that, that matter. Um, also, there are people that commit their life's work to the mathematical calculations behind um, projections. Uh, it's the uh, field of study is called geodesy. Um, I don't expect you to be those people. Um, GISs typically come with 
um, all of these coordinate system uh, coordinate systems and projections for you to be able to select from based on the location you're working in or working on or viewing or analyzing. And so again, I'll, I'll provide some context for these as we move through. Uh, Angular units of measure, important. Again, this is uh, thinking of uh, uh, the Earth as a sphere, not the two-dimensional, uh, so the three-dimensional. Just as we have very, various unit systems for measuring length, uh, such as inches, feet, meters, uh, light years, <laughs> uh, we have various unit systems for measuring angles. There are two systems in common use. Uh, the, the oldest system and the one that's uh, more commonly used is the degree system. And in this, a full circle is divided into 360 equal degrees. One degree, therefore, is only very, a very small part of the circle, and it's used uh, more commonly in mapping software. So again, the degree system is what you may encounter uh, more often as kind of a default uh, within uh, the GIS or the internet mapping technology that you're working with. A more natural system of angle measurement, uh, one that's based on the geometry of the circle itself, is the radian system. Uh, one radian is the angle formed when one radius is laid like a piece of wet spaghetti along the arcs of a circle's perimeter. Um, since the entire perimeter for any circle is only uh, 2 pi, uh, a bit more than six times the radius, there are far fewer radians than degrees in a full circle. But again, I, I explain these as these are two uh, common ways of uh, understanding unit systems, but more often you're going to be looking at or encountering the degree system. Um, decimal degrees versus degrees, minutes, seconds. And so geographic coordinates can be expressed in decimal degrees, uh, uh, denoted by the DD, abbreviated as DD, or in degrees, minutes, and seconds, DMS. Sometimes you'll need to convert from one form to another. Um, this is also um, uh, one of the things that's in your homework, so pay attention here. For example, the geographic coordinate expressed in degrees, minutes, seconds for New York City is in latitude and longitude, Latitude 40 degrees, 42 minutes, 51 seconds north. And longitude, it's 74 degrees, zero minutes, 21 seconds west. You can also express geographic coordinates in decimal degrees. Again, the, you can convert between the two. It's just another way to represent the same location, but in a different format. Um, in decimal degrees, you can see the difference in how it's uh, presented in decimal degrees. So latitude uh, 40.2. 714 and longitude negative 74.006. The positive and negative are associated with the um, which hemisphere um, and how the earth is divided between east and west and north and south. Although you can easily convert coordinates by hand, uh, you know, who does math by hand these days, right? Um, so we have uh, degrees, minutes, seconds, uh, decimal converter tools. And so there's a link here that can help you convert between decimal degrees and degrees, minutes, seconds. Again, pay special attention to that link because it's associated with your homework. I ask you about um, degrees, minutes, seconds, decimal degrees associated with Cleveland, Ohio. Different types of coordinate systems. And so the following are two common types of coordinate systems used in GIS. We have the global or spherical coordinate systems such as latitude, longitude, and these are often referred to as geographic coordinate systems. A projected coordinate system provides various mechanisms to project maps of the Earth's spherical surface onto a two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate plane. Projected coordinate systems are referred to as map projections, um, and you will encounter these a lot. Uh, this is one of the first things that we do in the software so that you can get a better understanding of what that looks like if you were to use different kinds of geographic coordinate systems, different kinds of projected coordinate systems. And again, what, what are the most common used from a global perspective versus your local perspective? Um, coordinate systems, both geographic and projected, provide a framework, that geographic framework, uh, when we were talking about uh, before we got to the angular unit, the measure, for defining real world locations. And there is a difference between the two. Um, know that you can convert between the two, but again, one's based on the globe, one's based on a flat surface. Parallels, so we're talking about latitude, um, is an angle which ranges from zero degrees at the equator to 90 degrees north or south. Again, remember the, the negative positive that I was just talking about in the uh, degrees, minutes, seconds, and decimal degrees. Lines of constant latitude or parallels run east-west as circles parallel to the equator. And you see this on, on maps, you see this on globes. The equator uh, of a rotating spheroid. Uh, spheroid is uh, one way to uh, describe um, our planet as a spheroid. 
uh, is the parallel circle of latitude at which latitude is defined to be zero. It is the imaginary line on the spheroid equidistant from its poles, dividing it into northern and southern hemispheres. Everything north of the equator has a positive latitude value and everything south of the equator has negative uh, values. So I give you an example here for um, Cairo, Egypt uh, and comparing that to uh, Cape Town. Um, so I'll let you take a look at that um, example. Now on the meridians. So the prime meridian is the meridian, a line of longitude um, in a geographic coordinate system at which longitude is defined to be zero. Just like we were talking about with parallels, you do the same with meridians. If one uses directions of east and west from a defined prime meridian, then they can be called the Eastern Hemisphere and Western Hemisphere. Longitudes for the Earth are measured from their prime meridian at 0 to 180 east and 0 to 180 west. West is denoted as a negative. Degrees of longitude are divided into 60 minutes. Each minute of longitude can be further divided into 60 seconds. So now you see the degrees, minutes, seconds. Um, I, I give an example here, uh, a comparison between Paris and uh, uh, Paris, France and Brazil. So again, I'll let you take a look at that to see the differences between that, uh, the denotations uh, for those things, uh, particularly um, east and west, just like we did with the parallels and north and south. So now we're going to move to geographic coordinate systems. Um, GCS it uses a three-dimensional spherical, spherical surface to define locations on the Earth. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about a datum. Um, a geographic coordinate system is often incorrectly called a datum. A datum itself is a little bit different. Uh, a datum is more of um, a model that's used uh, to kind of represent um, the uh, elevations and depressions um, over uh, the planet Earth. Not everything is, uh, because our planet is kind of in a state of flux, um, a datum has, uh, there are different models to represent that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, a geographic coordinate system includes an angular unit of measure, a prime meridian, and a datum, which is based on a spheroid. What shape really is our planet? Is it a perfect sphere? No, there are, um, again, depressions and elevations that, that change this model. The spheroid defines the size and shape of the Earth model, while the datum connects the spheroid to the Earth's surface. And a point is referenced by its latitude and longitude values. Longitude and latitude are angles measured from the Earth's center to a point on the Earth's surface. And the angles are often measured in degrees um, or in grads. Um, datums. So let's talk a little bit more about datums. Uh, prior to satellite mapping, the best approximation of the shape of the Earth was the mathematically calculated geoid. Um, a geoid is the hypothetical shape of the Earth um, and a regular shaped ball that uh, scientists, again, uh, if you're thinking of geodesy and geodesis, uh, these scientists use that, that model to more accurately calculate depths of earthquakes or any other deep object beneath the Earth's surface. So again, we're talking about what are some of the things that are happening um, on the Earth's surface. GCSs use a spheroid, a type of geoid, uh, so there are different models of geoids, spheroid one of them, to calculate positions on the Earth. A datum defines the position of the spheroid relative to the center of the Earth. And again, that's relative to depth and elevation. A geodetic datum is an abstract coordinate system with a reference surface such as sea level that serves to provide known locations to begin surveys and create maps. And all maps um, have to have some sort of starting point in which uh, these different angular units of measure, um, degrees, minutes, seconds, um, are placed uh, across the globe. Datums provide a starting or reference point and require accurate coordinates consistent with one another. Again, that consistent framework. And different datums have different starting points. Um, satellite data provide a geodesist with new measurements to define the best uh, Earth-fitting spheroid, which relates coordinates to the Earth's center of mass. Um, an Earth-centered or geocentric datum uses the Earth's center of a mass as the origin. More reading on this I have um, posted in the um, assignment links and the uh, uh, class session links so that you can read more about this. Datums are uh, a really difficult thing. Really, a lot of these geographic principles are difficult to, uh, if it's not something you use on a regular basis, if it's not something you think about on a regular basis, it's going to need some additional detail. Um, 
The most recently developed and widely used datum is WGS 1984, that stands for World Geodetic System, um, and it was created in 1984, and it serves as a framework for locational measurements worldwide. So we're talking a global, um, a global datum. So it's not specific uh, to Cleveland, but if you were doing things locally, you may have something that better fits. But World Geodetic System of 1984 is something that um, you will encounter a lot, and it's a, a global uh, framework. It's, it's something you can use no matter where you're doing analysis um, across the globe. Uh, more about datums. There are two main horizontal datums in the United States. Uh, we have the World Geodetic System that I just mentioned. It was defined by the U.S. Department of Defense, and it's commonly used within civilian GPS software. Uh, so your, your uh, Google Maps, things like that within your phone um, or other devices, oftentimes uh, associated with WGS-84. North American datum of 1983, abbreviated as NAD83, is the most recent datum and is used most commonly when focusing on the US. So if you are working on something specific in the United States, I expect that many of you will, um, NAD83 um, is what uh, you will see often as the datum associated with US work. There's also a vertical datum. Uh, again, remember that third dimension, that elevation and depth. The most common used vertical datum in the US is the North American vertical datum of 1988, NAVD88. Um, unless you're doing things, unless you're doing GIS analysis or, or have ge geographic information that has vertical datum, most of the time you're just gonna be working with a horizontal datum. Um, and again, so we have WGS84 globally and NAD83 locally, uh, speaking US. When dealing with paper maps and charts, the datums are typically listed in the legend of the map. Uh, so again, when we were talking about uh, cartographic principles, what kinds of information do you include on your map? This would be one of those things that you cite when you're producing a map. Um, in fact, both horizontal and vertical datum are usually provided, but at a minimum, the horizontal datum should be provided. Um, again, I think I don't, unless you're doing uh, survey work, um, I did uh, have some experience with uh, the vertical datums because of work that I was doing in stormwater management. We were mapping um, all of the uh, water pipes, uh, stormwater uh, in particular, um, underground. And so we had to have um, a depth, um, a Z value associated with that. And so we needed a vertical datum. But most of the time, if you're not using survey work um, and, and out in the field with things that are below the earth's surface, you're gonna be using horizontal datums. Um, and from a basic introductory standpoint, just focus on the horizontal. Local datums, um, they align its spheroid to closely fit the Earth's surface in a particular area. Uh, so a point on the surface of the spheroid is matched to a particular position on the surface of the Earth. This point is known as the, as the origin point of the datum. The coordinates of the origin point are fixed and all other points are calculated from it. So again, having that um, consistent geographic framework. The coordinate system origin of a local datum is not at the center of the Earth the center of the spheroid of a local datum is offset from the Earth's center. And become, because a local datum aligns its spheroid so closely to a particular area on the Earth's surface, it's not suitable for use outside the area for which it was designed. Um, so again, you may be um, doing work in Cleveland and there's a local datum and that's associated with Northeast Ohio, Northern Ohio. Um, there's also ones that are specifically set for different states, different countries. So again, it's um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, mapping and GIS analysts um, don't use local datums if they're doing international um, or national work. Um, if you are studying or working on uh, uh, geographic analysis that's related to Cleveland, then that's gonna define uh, what datum you use. Um, we talked about some of the more commonly used, but if you don't wanna get into that, you can use um, a global datum um, as kind of a, a shortcut. But again, it's not gonna be as good of a fit as a local one. We'll talk about more, more of this as we go through and specifically when we get to the software, um, uh, software exercises. Um, transformations. So if two data sets are not referenced to the same geographic coordinate system, you might need to perform something called a datum transformation, a geographic transformation. It's a well-defined mathematical method to convert coordinates between two geographic coordinate systems. Again, you don't need to know the math behind it because that uh, those mathematical calculations are built into your GISs. 
But as with coordinate systems, there are several hundred predefined geographic transformations that you can access. Um, you're not going to be doing this too much in an introductory uh, in these exercises that we have for this class, but it's important to correctly use a geographic transformation if it's required. Usually that's something you do when you're a little bit more advanced, but when neglected, coordinates can be in the wrong location by up to a few hundred meters, um, and that's bad, right? If you're doing analysis, particularly spatial analysis, how close or far are things to each other, the wrong location can throw your analysis off by a, a pretty significant distance. Sometimes no transformation exists and you have to use a third GCS like the World Ge Geodetic System of 84, like we talked about as a combination um, of um, a geographic framework. Um, again, it's important for me to mention transformations to you that you can move um, from one uh, geographic reference system to another, it's possible. Um, I don't think you're gonna be doing a lot of it though in a basic sense. Now on a projected coordinate systems. So a projected coordinate system is defined on a flat two-dimensional surface. So unlike a geographic coordinate system, a projected coordinate system has constant lengths, lengths angles, and area across the two dimensions. A projected coordinate system is always based on a geographic coordinate system that is based on a sphere or spheroid, that datum. The things that um, can, can be in flux though, features such as size, shape, distance, or scale. Um, I should say size, shape, distance, or direction. I'm gonna, I can't fix that right now, but size, shape, distance, or direction um, can be measured accurately on earth. Once projected on a flat surface, however, only some of these qualities can be accurately represented. Um, every map has some sort of distortion. The larger the area covered by a map, the greater the distortion. Uh, you know, alternately, um, the smaller the area covered by the map, the, the less the distortion. More on map projections. Whether you treat the earth as a sphere or a spheroid, you must transform its three-dimensional surface to create a flat map sheet. Um, this mathematical transformation is commonly referred to as a map projection. Um, a spheroid cannot be flattened to a plane any more easily than a piece of orange peel can be flattened. Um, it will tear. And so representing the Earth's surface in two dimensions causes distortion in the shape, area, distance, or direction of the data. Different projections cause different types of distortions, and some projections are designed to minimize the distortions of one or two of the data's characteristics. Um, a projection could maintain the area of a feature but alter its shape. Um, going back to, um, I'm just going to uh, go back, I need to update this, this uh, particular slide. Size, shape, distance, and direction. Um, scale is associated with distance, um, but these are the properties that change depending on the projection that you use. Size, shape, distance, or direction. Um, I have a video clip here <clears throat> about map projections. It's a Vox video clip, so, you know, whatever you feel about the political persuasion of Vox, still is a good little video clip about map projections because it's pretty straightforward. Planar projections, so we have different kinds of projections. Um, planar projections, also called as muthal projections, project ma map data onto a flat surface. The simplest planar projection is tangent to the globe at one point. And although the point of contact may be any point on the Earth's surface, the north and south poles are the most common contact points for most GIS databases. Again, that's starting point. Other locations are used primarily for specific applications such as navigation or locational inset maps. Um, when the plane touches the Earth at either the north or south poles, longitude lines converge at the point of contact and radiate outward from the pole at their true angle, like the spokes on a wheel. The distance between them increasing as the distance from the contact point increases. So as you're watching uh, these lines, uh, longitude lines, um, go from these different poles, you notice that they start to increase in distance uh, between them as um, you go north or south from these poles. Um, latitude lines appear as a series of concentric circles, right? There isn't, uh, there is some uh, uh, difference in uh, the distance between them, not as much as uh, longitude lines. <laughs> Different examples of these kind of projections. Um, and I have uh, um, bolded the ones that you may encounter more often than others. So we have azimuthal, um, equidistant, as muthal equal area, uh, mnemonic, stereographic, and orthographic projections. 
And we have conic or conical projections. Uh, they have meridians mapped to equally spaced parallels originate, originating from the top, while the parallels are mapped to circular arcs which are centered at the top. Two standard lines visualized as uh, secant lines are picked in the process of making a conic projection. When a single parallel line is used, the distance uh, along the parallel um, is stretched. Um, different examples of conic maps include equidistant, Albers, and Lambert conformal conic. Again, I have some uh, links in here with the title so that you can go and take a look more at these different kinds of projections visually. We have cylindrical projection, um, and that is any projection in which the meridians are mapped to parallel spaced vertical lines and latitudes are mapped to horizontal lines. The projections stretch from east to west and are the same, same at any chosen latitude. And the north to south stretching equals east to west, but grows with latitude faster than east to west stretching. Mercator projection is an example of a cylindrical projection, which became a standard map projection because of its ability to represent lines of steady course. Um, it was a standard map projection, particularly because of its navigational properties. Uh, Mercator distorts the size of geographical objects uh, because its linear scale increases with the increase in latitude, but the distortion caused by the Mercator distorts the perception of the entire planet by exaggerating the areas laying far from the equator. Um, when you look at that link, you'll see some of those things. And I think to a certain degree, you'll see that in the, the Vox video clip as well. There are, again, there are hundreds of projections. I'm just kind of putting out some of the most common that you may encounter. Equal area map projections, also known as equivalent or authentic projections. Um, they represent areas correctly on the map, those areas. The areas of features on the map are proportional to their areas on the reference surface of Earth. Maintaining relative areas of features causes distortion in their shapes, which is more pronounced in small scale maps though. In conformal map projections, also known as orthomorphic orthomorphic or autogonal projection, local angles are preserved. That's angles at every point on the projected flat map are the same as the angles around the point on the curved spherical surface. Similarly, constant uh, local scale is maintained in every direction around a point. Therefore, shapes are represented accurately and without distortion for small areas. But when you get uh, into larger areas, those do get distorted. So again, this is kind of an example of um, local versus global. Um, and some of those distortions that occur based on where you are um, and what's important when you're preparing your map. As a result of preserving angles and shapes, area or size of features are distorted in these kinds of maps. No map can be both conformal and equal area. So that's, that's something to consider is that each one of these different type, uh, each different type of projection has some sort of stretching, has some sort of distortion, and it's gonna affect these different map properties of size, distance, uh, area, and direction um, as part of that distortion. Then we have equidistant map projections. They're accurate distances. Um, they're maintained only between one or two points to every other point on the map. So also in most projections, there are one or more standard lines along which the scale remains constant. Distances measured along these lines are proportional to the same distance measurement on the curved reference surf surface. So again, our globe to a flat surface. Equidistant projections are neither conformal nor equal area, but rather a compromise between them. And so as geodesists prepare um, the next iteration of uh, 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 distortions, um, I think that's what you're gonna see more and more are projections that um, preserve um, as much as possible in terms of these, um, these uh, properties of map projections. So area, si uh, area size, shape, and direction. That, that's, that's really something that um, I think is future applicable, is how do we cause least amount of distortion with our projections. Widely used projections, Mercator, it's the oldest map projection. Um, it was designed as a navigational tool for sailors. Um, that it is associated with a person. Mercator's latitudinal and longitudinal distortion is significant and therefore affects area, shape, area and shape of features, but it preserves distance and direction, therefore ideal for navigation. So again, seeing uh, which projection is appropriate for the type of map that you're making. On a Mercator projection, Greenland is roughly the same size as Africa. And so we know in reality, Africa is almost 14 times larger. 
Um, so something to keep in mind, Google Maps being Yahoo and even OpenStreetMaps continue using some version of the Mercator to display the world. So again, this idea of representation, we as a human, uh, as humans decided that we're going to use that particular projection to display the world, even though we know that it has some uh, impact on how we understand the world around us. Uh, so this example of Greenland and Africa, if that's what you see, um, and, and uh, one of the things that you see as uh, part of your curriculum um, in, in uh, elementary school or high school, for example, um, you're thinking that those two places are these two places within a Mercator projection are the same thing when in fact they're not. Um, so projection matters. Um, the characteristics of the Peters projection are that they have equal area, equal access, and equal positions. Uh, the map shows all areas according to their actual size, so a contrast from Mercator. Accurate comparisons become possible uh, when it, with respect to equal access. North-south lines run vertically on this map, so geographic points can be seen in their correct geographical location or relationship, northwest, northeast, southwest, or southeast. Equal positions, all east-west lines run parallel. So the, direct, the relationship of any point on the map to its distance from the equator or to the angle of the sun can be easily determined. Um, have a fun little uh, video clip here, uh, old West Wing uh, um, clip about the Peters projection and its comparison to the Mercator projection. I think you'll enjoy that. Uh, and some of you may have watched West Wing um, or maybe watching it now. Um, so again, a connection to real world. Uh, another projection that's widely used is the Robinson projection, um, fairly recent, created in 1963, and it focused more on the look of the map than precise measurements of places. So this particular type of map, it's neither equal area nor conformal, is a general purpose tool. Uh, so when we're thinking about those different map types, general reference maps, it shows the entire world at once, but compromises both area and angles, especially at the poles. And then uh, Winkle Triple. It's the opposite of Robinson. The map prevents three major types of distortion, area, direction, and distance. National Geographic Society has been drawing all of its standard maps using the Winkle Triple projection since 1998. Um, so when you're, uh, I don't know if you get National Geographic, it's one of the, uh, one of the mags that I, I read a lot, um, and particularly because of its maps, um, that you can make the association now. Winkle Triple projection is used on National Geographic Society maps. It doesn't preserve angles. It's not used for navigation. It's more of a general purpose uh, way to look at an area that's being described. And it shouldn't be used for navigation. It's more of location, uh, relationships between places, um, and to a certain degree, some of those physical features. So general reference map again. Um, a little bit more about scale. Uh, map scale refers to the relationship or ratio between distance on a map and the corresponding distance on the ground. Um, the map author determines the most appropriate distance unit ratio. Um, maps can be described by how varied the scale is. Maps that show a large geographic area in comparison to the relative size of the map are known as small scale maps. The small scale map refers to how small the fraction is. A map showing the entire world would be considered a small scale map, whereas a map showing a neighborhood would be considered a large scale map. Small scale maps tend to show a larger geographic area and less detailed, and large scale maps show a smaller geographic area with greater detail. Um, this is often, map scale is often confused, uh, large scale and small scale, or interpreted incorrectly because the smaller the map scale, the larger the reference number and vice versa. Um, so for example, uh, a one to 100,000 scale map is considered a larger scale than a one to 250,000 scale map. Map scales are extremely important when determining the actual distance between two places. So again, thinking about what am I preparing my map for, um, who's the intended audience, and how a scale fit into that discussion. All map scales, such as verbal, fractional, and bar scales, involve ratios because you're comparing the distance between two points on a map and the actual distance between the points on the ground. Um, we talked a little bit about this in cartographic principles again. Uh, we have verbal scale, fractional scale, and bar scales. Um, verbal scale is the simplest of the three types of map scales. It provides map distance and actual distance. An example of a verbal scale is one centimeter equals 30 miles. In this distance, one centimeter on the map equals a straight line distance of 30 miles. But do you see how that's written out? One centimeter equals 30 miles. Um, it's written out in full with those characters. 
Different from that is fractional scales. They're written as either a fraction or as a ratio because fractions are ratios that compare a numerator to a denominator. So as some of your um, college algebra and your college math, um, using the above example, the verbal scale one centimeter to 30 miles would be written as either one over 30 or one to 30. Fractional scales are more difficult to use because the units are not provided. So you need to measure the map length and two specific points on the map to determine the units used uh, on the scale. Third is the bar scale, also found on official maps. Bar scales are, are advantageous because the physical representation of the distance on the map is provided. For example, one inch could equal five miles on a bar scale. Bar scales sometimes confuse people because of the first piece of the bar, usually the left end of the bar, is labeled as one mile or one kilometer, not as zero miles or kilometers. So again, that linear distance, but more of its labeling. This occurs because the map makers want to divide that first piece of the bar into fractions of miles, such as half mile, quarter mile, to fine tune the scale. Bar scales are advantageous because you can change the size of the bar to fit the size of the map. There are different ways to um, uh, insert scale um, as part of your map output, uh, but the actual scale itself is determined um, and is associated with um, uh, the coordinate systems and the projections. So um, seeing how all three of these geographic principles go together is important. Um, I have scale to actual distance, fractional or ratio. Um, these are a lot more of the examples. I'm not going to go through this um, word for word. I'm going to let you take a look at this um, as it relates to the types of scales, scale to actual distance, fractional ratio. Um, so here is an exercise for you to go through a mathematical exercise of how to convert, um, how to um, create that representative fraction or ratio. And then finally, what does this have to do with GIS? So a GIS is an information system built to represent geographic principles. Um, again, we're taking something that's kind of a, a representation and starting to put some facts to it, some actual um, mathematical calculations, um, some historic uh, principles and properties, and putting that um, into uh, as part of the foundational elements of your geographic information within the system that you're using. And so Spatial reference, map projections, datums, and coordinate systems translate to scale. Understanding these principles will help you understand why a GIS works the way it does. And geographic principles are the underlying theories to accurate spatial representation. And so I have, I know that these are some like big ticket types of concepts. And so I have additional readings that, um, in addition to the links within the presentation, I have additional readings um, that I encourage you to look at if these are um, concepts that either A, you haven't, uh, you need to freshen, uh, refresh your memory on these things, um, or you've never done it before, maybe you kind of skated through that class and you didn't do good on this particular part. Um, you can read more about these, um, uh, and I encourage you to do that. It's not, these are probably some of the most difficult things uh, for students uh, or for people just starting out in GIS is to understand uh, these geographic principles. And I think they're really important as concepts to understand the data that you're looking at within a mapping technology or a GIS. And, um, you know, knowing the theories and knowing those principles um, are helpful when you encounter things that don't look right. So you can ask questions. Um, and a lot of this information in here are the types of questions and more of a foundational element to how you might set up your GIS, uh, your mapping technology, and also understand well, you know, what's the difference between this projection and that projection or why, you know, why is uh, Africa and Greenland the same size if I'm looking at this map, but I look at this map and they're different. These, again, these principles will help you start to ask more questions and um, make you more map literate, um, geographic literacy, map literacy, um, asking the right questions, knowing the data that's being presented to you and being able to question those things because again, maps are representations and representations based on us as humans coming up with the um, theories behind the way that we see this. So I encourage you to do some additional reading. Um, and I have some questions for you. Again, one of them is the uh, uh, degrees, minutes, seconds, um, and uh, decimal degrees uh, for Cleveland, but a few other questions as well. Again, the questions that I ask you, um, the questions that I ask you in these assignments um, are 
going to be valuable for you, not just generally, but they're also going to be on the midterm. So keeping uh, keeping these things in mind and paying attention to them um, are really important. Um, and I hope that the additional reading and details uh, give you help with that. I will uh, stop the um, recording now. Let's see here.